If your ink's too slow and your nib won't flow, here's one of the places that you can go. Larry is here to see you through with Mr. Announcer and Cubby too. It's Larry's Fountain Pen Review. A, was it is that a question daniel yeah um i it's it might be off subject i, I don't want it to get off subject but um something that keeps coming to my mind uh, uh, i wish i if i'd known in advance i'd try to find a book to show you what i'm talking about but uh, a lot of the older books uh, would have the very first letter on the page Versals. would be a great big beautiful letter and and almost sometimes pictorial and then it would start the first and it would set the, the tone for the entire rest of the page. Uh, what do you call that? And do you do that? And yeah, is that something I have? It's, it's ornamentation. Yeah, exactly. And what the, the letters were sometimes called versals. Uh, they were very, very ornate. Let me see if I can find someone to show you. And they were also hand painted uh, sometimes in some of the old Bible. Right. The, they were just mm -hmm. maybe big red letters that were the first fancy letter. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in word processing, we used to be able to set up a drop cap, and you may yes. basically be able to yep. do it now. Hmm. Yeah, I know that the, it was almost like a, a square or a block. A great and they were usually giant. up in the top left corner, and then yeah. the next paragraph yeah. would be a smaller variation of the same type of ornamentation. Yeah. Uh, well, many of the old, again? many of the old manuscripts. That's pretty much how they were all written. Um, yeah. Every page. What, what do you What do you call that it's again? That or ornamentation. Ornamentation, versals is another name for it. Um, uh, you could call it ornamented drop caps because um, drop caps is still, a, they wouldn't have called it drop caps, but that's a term that would be understandable today. There are, it's not something I've studied. I've studied the style of, of, of adding the ornamentation to those letters, but then mm -hmm. the other specific names are escaping me at the moment. It's not something that is used uh, very often or at all in ornamental penmanship, mm -hmm. really. Um, okay. Yeah. That? yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. This was done Beautiful. by one of the masters of the pointed pen, actually, Willis Baird. And if you see the actual specimen in Iampet, this is in Iampet's archives. It looks like mm -hmm. those acanthus leaves. You can reach in and pull them out. That's how well, and that's, that's gold leaf around the edge with filigree yeah. on it. And there were some that actually had, uh, I'm trying to think who some <laughs> It's harder. I have gigabytes upon gigabytes. <laughs> so I don't even bother trying. I have all this stuff somewhere in here, but I can't find it as quick as Joe can. <laughs> the, the, the first one is called a versal. The first letter the, is a versal, you said? Well, you can, but it's an illuminated cap. Here's another There's one. The prop, that's what most people would call it, illuminated capitals. This that's is the also the most bear. common name. You see that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. This is an example of many different kinds. And there's no, yeah. some of them have pictorials in there that show like people or something like that. I have examples. Yeah. Of I just, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but this, this would actually be criticized by modern, some modern, I know, God rest her soul, that Sheila Waters didn't like this because she said it was too, too dated in this look. But that's exactly what these guys really. That's a choice. Did. Exactly. It was a choice and it was meant you're going for a certain look with this. And mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine what you'd have to charge for this today? I, I, oh, it's a beautiful I did I did a very simplistic one for my sister when she got married. And I, I sat at the chair for like 40 hours getting this thing mapped out and done. And you want to just pay me my regular salary for 40 hours? No one will pay that for a piece <laughs> like that. So, nope. you know, no, I mean, it's crazy. I don't think I have a, that I can remember any of these things. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I yeah. got one. So the one you just uh, showed us uh, that had the color in it, the red. Can you pull that up again for a minute, please? I think I closed it already. This is the one I did for my sister. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. There. You, you see, this my, is so amateurish, uh, though. Yeah. You see, like marriage, like uh, the the uh, M. That's a versal, an illuminated yeah, versal. Right, right. Now, I, I really like that when when you're doing work like that, the different colors that are put in it, it just looks so strapped, just so nice. Is that hard to do? It, it's not easy, but I'll tell you this. That was a very simplistic approach because I don't mix colors. And so okay. the criticism I would get for that's a few things. One, they're just, they're just basic pure colors. Two, I probably should have filled in more space with that stuff because there's too much empty space there. 
but you know, it was done for my sister. I did, I did maybe three of those, four of those in my, in my lifetime of doing those. Uh, I didn't enjoy doing them, you know, I don't, like, yeah. I just, not, for a penman like yourself, yeah, they're not the most exciting thing to do because they are slow and they are tedious. Um, I've done a few certificates over the years and they are the end. It's, it's a great end product to look at. And it's great when it's finished, be like, ah, that looks cool. But at the end of the day, I would rather work on my ornamental penmanship than, than take the time creating those, which is sort of a catch 22. Cause at the end, I don't have any beautiful certificates that I can look at. Cause I, I don't like putting in the time to create them. I couldn't locate wow. it, but I have a, I have an image that shows the, the pencil work I had to do before I could actually execute that, the lines, the slant angles, drawing in the, 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 the letters. I mean, you see Jake Weidman do this. Yeah. Jake Weidman pencil stuff and then goes over with ink and paint. That's fine. The whole goal of the masters of the past with this stuff was to get it right. It wasn't about, oh, I could execute this in one stroke. It had nothing to do with it. They, Slow they, and perfect. Right. They retouched everything. Yeah, they retouched it, which we mean that today, someone like Nord would probably use Photoshop. I mean, it's yep. the truth. So, Joe, what kind of paper did you use yeah. on that? That was uh, Arches paper from France. That's a 150-pound hot press. There's several different kinds of paper. You probably know this, Lance, but the hot press is a much smoother paper. Then there's the cold press, which is meant for brush, pit, watercolors, and stuff. Um, I don't enjoy writing on that paper because it's firm. It doesn't give me any springs. Uh, Michael, we didn't touch on that cushion sheet and stuff like that, but one of the reasons, Larry, why he makes those blotters is so you're not writing on a hard surface. And, and, and that thing I did for my sister, that was a hard, heavy paper. And some people would actually put uh, cushion sheets below that so it bounced but I never right. liked writing on that surface never yep it's like also a lot of times when you're doing <laughs> stuff on pieces like that nowadays anyways you'll be using a light board or something like that which when you're writing on a light board it's a hard surface I hate doing work on a light board because I don't have my cushy surface you can get there are squishy clear mats that you can buy now but Michael, you know there are people that use like Debbie Zine put put out the laser liner. Yep. It's, you project a laser beam across the page to give you the flat surface to write on, um, but it's it, it matters. The surface does matter, you know. And if you're writing on too big a piece, you've got to stretch out to do it. And I'm very fussy about the position I'm in, you know, what, when I do this kind of work. So. That's the, uh, there's one old image of, I think it was, it was Love for a Zaner, I can't remember, but there's an image of them signing a certificate and it's a huge certificate and it's like rolled up on the table in front of them. And it's just an interesting sort of insight into, they had to be, they were more adaptable than I feel like we think they were. Um, one, one great example actually is back in the day, autograph books were super common in not just penmanship schools, but I mean, how many Victorian style autograph books show up on eBay on a daily basis? Just tons. You would get all your friends would sign their autographs for whatever school or college or university. Um, if I were to give like if I took a book like this today, just like a random, just a random landscape book that and asked, I took this to somebody at convention and said, sign this penman today. And I, I'm one of them, so I'm, I'm criticizing myself as well. We go, oh, but like, it's not like even on the table and there's all wits. We're very finicky about things. But I always then say, well, they used to do it. So why can't we do it now? I feel like we're a little too, we're too whiny now. We've got, we, we, we train in too specific of a way. A lot of things have to do with the paper, though. You know, there was a time where most of what these penmen wrote on was acid containing wood pulp paper. And so that's why these, these documents, if you see any of the documents I am, but they're in my own archives, if you bend that page a little bit, it cracks. They become, and also that paper in combination with iron gall ink is a recipe for disaster because any humidity, mm. the iron gall will produce free radicals with the, with the humidity and will actually cleave the paper. We have specimens especially in Iampeth, where you'll see any of the heavy shades from the iron gold are missing. Yep. They were totally, the, the paper was cleaved in that area, exactly. Cleaved in that area. So um, I think that was a pretty good demonstration, Michael, and 
I was having a fun discussion with my uh, I have a discord community of, of penmen, ornamental penmen and whatnot. And we were chatting just the other day because, I mean, we've all talked about before uh, how good nibs were back in the day versus what they are now. Um, but the conversation never talks about how good and unfortunately they wouldn't pass most health and safety regulations or they're not archival and are archival and things like that. But right. the paper they were using yep. is something we also haven't, we're not close to anymore. Um, I, I would love to find some chemist who could find a way of sizing a paper in a way that fits today's standards because the page, the papers back then, I'm pretty sure what made them good was because they were using chemicals and stuff that we're not allowed to use anymore. Right. Um, but that doesn't exist. And I feel like that's a conversation that I'm now trying to bring to or bring to the attention of paper manufacturers. Like we've, I mean, I've brought the nib thing. Many of us have brought that to the attention of nib manufacturers and whatnot over the years. But paper is, uh, is another thing that I want to um, see if we can do. Because it's, it's possible, I guarantee. It's just a matter of finding somebody who can, who can do it. Yeah, there's uh, the other thing that sometimes I know. I just one more point. We <laughs> no, keep no, talking. No, sorry, it's not done. <laughs> it's not done in pointed pen work, but broad pen people will actually pounce the paper. Yeah. They have a little. I said gum ammoniac. Is it? No, it's gum. It's gum uh, sandarac. I'm sorry, gum sandarac is what they use, and they pounce the surface with the with the porous uh, uh, pad, and that lays down some of the gum. gum I know it's gum sandarac, and what that does is it gives pushback against the ink so they can get crisper lines. The problem is you can't do that. With, I've done that with the broad pen, but you can't do it with a pointed pen. That would cake up on the nib. Anyway, just wanted to put that point in there. I'm taking, I, this past week, just like a week ago, I dove into the fun world of book binding randomly for no other reason than why the heck not. I've why never not? done it before. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all I've done for the past <laughs> week now. Um, my plan, this is last night I made a, ran, a DIY lap book plow so I could clean my edges and whatnot. I'm taking this little book to Iampeth. I'm sad you're not going to be there, Joe, because mm -hmm. my goal is, and people will complain and cry, but I'm going to try to get, I've tried to do it in the past before and people have complained, but I'm going to see if I can get people to sign like they used to do back in the day eventually. On good paper, right? Well, this is, this is my favorite paper to write on. It's um, for many years, my favorite paper was Clairefontaine or Rodeo paper. Oh, I yeah. still, it's still really, really close to my favorite, but the biggest issue of it is you can't buy it in bulk. You have to buy expensive pads of it. And for those of us who are practicing a lot, I go through a heck of a lot of paper. Um, Rodeo R, the, the premium Rodeo. Yeah, it's the ivory one. Yeah. But so what, I've, what I like about this paper, I don't know if you've ever seen, I made the landscape, the landscape journals that, that, uh, Bailey and I created a number of years ago, uh, we found a paper called Via Smooth, which is, I like it. It's not quite as smooth as Rhodia, but sometimes I like the slight bit of extra tooth. It requires me to be a little bit more careful because the, the risk of having a nib snap is there. But sometimes that extra tooth I find quite enjoyable, especially if I'm using a fountain pen or something like that, because Rhodia Many penmen in the past, I've been, people have used it and it feels too skatey. Um, it's, it's very, very smooth. And I, I mean, I like Rhodia. I can't say a thing bad about it. Um, this is almost Rhodia, but slightly, slightly more tooth, but not enough to get crazy nib snaps or anything like that. And yeah, it's my own, it's my own paper that I ordered and then bound the books with that. So we'll see. Well, I had fun. Yeah. Any questions, anybody? This has been Joe and I have just been talking for a while. <laughs> you have a question. On the uh, signatures you design for your clients, what do they do with the signatures once you give it to them? So most of the time, people specifically, they'll order a something, like a, a leather desk blotter like Larry has, or somebody will send me a bag or a pad folio or something like that. So what I'm doing is designing a signature to put on that thing. I don't think to date anybody's ever done anything else with the signature because um, they don't ever really like I don't digitize them. 
uh, when I finish designing something, I take a photo of it. I send it to them to say, what are your thoughts? Like sometimes I'll use a variation of a letter they don't like or something like that. Uh, so I allow them to, to tweak it if they want to. Luckily, most people don't. Most people just trust me to do my thing, which is, which is awesome. Um, but most of the time, the signatures are just that. They are specifically for the product. Um, so if they wanted to have it, like people have um, in the past, I think tattoos have been got of some of the things I've designed. But for the most part, they're buying the blotter and I'm designing the name to go on it. Uh, and how, does it, how, how do you put it on there? Sorry? How do you get it onto the blotter? So the process, it's I call it hand foiling. It's essentially very similar to how like a, a regular book would have a, a brass die made and then pressed like a hot brass die pressed into a leather foil that would attach it. Um, I just do that with a wood burning tool. So I have a wood burning pen here. Um, I have a wood burning tool that has a lot of temperature control in the low end. And then a number of years ago, I started experimenting with using regular printing foil that's used in the, in the leather and all, basically all product foiling industry, experimenting with many hundreds of different formulas of foils and whatnot to see if I could do it by hand, um, to see if I could foil by hand. So this is a technique that I sort of, I don't know if grandfathered is the right word or, I didn't invent it. Um, it was, I found out later uh, in the scrapbooking world, like dots, people would use the same sort of technique to create dots in the scrapbooking world. But to my knowledge, before, before I started doing my signatures on leather, that or on any material really, um, it didn't really exist. Uh, there's a video process of how it goes on. So it's just writing. It's much slower than this. These are, all my videos are sped up because it's a very slow process. Mm -hmm. um, I get asked all the time if I can go fast and I can, but in order to go fast, the pen has to be hotter. And then if I pause for a fraction of a second, it'll like burn through the foil or something like that. Um, That's the amazing. Machine, yeah. It's very fun. Wow. It's a good time. It is, it is high stress because <laughs> unlike ink, I can just throw a piece of paper away and start again or something that I can erase or scratch off of vellum or something. There is no repairing uh, foil. Um, once the foil's on there, it's not nearly as uh, fragile as you, as you would imagine a gold foil on a leather or on any surface would be. Um, I've done tours through Germany and in Europe working for like bag companies. Um, and that's very stressful because somebody will hand you a $600 purse. And then I, if I mess up, well, that just lives on the purse. That purse is essentially garbage in that moment. So when I get hired for those things, there, I mean, that's that's the pressure that goes along with um, what's well, good. Larry, I, that, that video is exactly what he did for your blotter. Yeah, wow. there's a there is a video coming for Larry's blotter. I have about a hundred <laughs> videos that I have to edit um, of of blotter. I'm very behind in my video editing for those, but I film every blotter I make. I a bunch of questions. I, I got to let it out. First of all, sorry for interrupting. No, I'm not. You good? Anyway. Oh. <laughs> You all guys belong to a calligraphy club. That's number one. Number sec second question, are you and Joe and whoever else has left uh, the last of the calligraphy dinosaurs? I'm a dinosaur, but probably more musically, Larry. I like cream and tendon. <laughs> you know, no, there's a lot of great calligraphers out there. Maybe penmen, strict penmen. There's not many of them, but I don't oh, think wow. we're at all the last of anything. They, you know, no. So I have... So to answer your first question, I'm not a member of any calligraphy club other than Iampeth, which is a Pemmin association, uh, and it doesn't run like a guild. I am affiliated or associated with a couple of the guilds here in Canada, um, but I'm not an official member just because I moved to Canada into a pandemic, so the guilds weren't doing anything, so there was no point me paying a, a, a dues or whatnot. So I will, I will join the Vancouver Guild. Um, once they start doing things again, because unfortunately, pointed pen and ornamental penmanship isn't a big thing in Western Canada. It's almost <laughs> nobody does it here. So unfortunately, I'm living in a city where what I do and what I'm essentially an expert on doesn't exist. But that also affords me the potential opportunity of creating my own community here, which I hope to do once 
the pandemic is luckily, I mean, it's almost basically gone now, but once we can get more and more normal, I hope to start creating that. Uh, and to answer your second question, are we the dinosaurs? Um, over the past, I'll say three to five years, there has been a huge and huge in the span of penmanship. It's still a very niche thing. Right. Um, but from the point of me starting Pointed Pen uh -huh. to, to now, recent years, the interest in doing proper traditional ornamental, pen, ornamental penmanship and just the capability of doing it to a high level has grown, I think, in my just view and seeing what people are doing uh, exponentially. I think and this is potentially a bold statement. But I think in the history of the world, since the like 1890s and up until like the 1920s, I believe we are closer, the community of penmen are closer today to re, we're not there yet, but there is a number of us that are closer today to recreating what they could do in the 1800s uh, than, than anything. And that's not to, I don't want to, that's not to, be mean or whatnot to people that came before me because it's it's not to do with me there's just with the with the internet and the accessibility of information and there's a lot of people who are getting into it as hobbyists who are young like there's 14 15 year olds who are getting into it they see it as cool they see it as difficult and they're diving in at a younger age than i didn't get into it till i was in my my 20s and 30s um so it's it's growing um, uh, rapidly in in my opinion or from what I see and it's cool. We're limited obviously by our tools and what is available to us versus back in the day. Um, but with the combination of good papers and learning how to tune nibs and stuff like that, it's a lot more work. We can't just open a box of nibs and use um, what was there. But like at convention next week, I'm going to be giving a demo on how I sharpen my, my calligraphy nibs, which is way easier to do than fountain pen grinding. But I, I custom sharpen every nib I use so that it can acquire the lines that I know my arm or my hand is capable of creating. Um, and there are, I, my students, are they're, they're better than me, a lot of them now. And there's people that, that have just started that if they keep going, they're definitely gonna be better than me. So it's, for me, it's an exciting time to be an ornamental penman because I feel like something is happening now that hasn't happened since the 1890s. Right. And he's talking specifically about pointed pen work. Yes. Because there have always, there, for the longest time, there have been broad pen, gothic letters, things like that, then going back a long time. The height of irony to me is that where this all started in England with, 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 with English round hand script, which is a very different form of script, but... It started there, but yet the English had no use for copper play script. It was we only do it here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's really amazing. It would be like the United States rejecting rock and roll. I mean, I, you know, or jazz, it's, it's, it's to that level. So I think uh, well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, Mike. It's a similar point, Joe, to ornamental penmanship, Spencerian, all that style of penmanship is derived. It's an, it's an American script. The people who are best at it and the communities that are doing the most is China, Asian, it's the Asian communities, it's Europe. Like, it's not, I mean, there are, don't get me wrong, there are people in North America that are we're doing a really good job. And it's not just, I'm not just saying the Chinese penmen are, are easily the best. It's Europe. Like, there are Europeans that are doing it. There are Chinese people that are doing it. There's Japanese communities. There are Filipino communities. Which, which is why I'm so disappointed that it doesn't exist in Western Canada because I travel the world teaching it and everybody wants it everywhere but here, which is random. Prophet is not respected in his hometown, you know? <laughs> yes, <But> exactly, <laughs> my, precisely. My book has been translated now into Chinese and Spanish so far. So, and that wasn't something I paid. They just wanted to do it. So, right. uh, and I made sure it was was accurate to what I had what written, but... You know, it's amazing. But like you said, especially Asian markets. Oh, my God. It's, oh, it's huge. And pens. Like, the, there's a number of Asian pen makers who are making, uh, not fountain pens, but like oblique holders, what, what we're using. It's, it's people, this is their income. Like, this is people's entire jobs. 
which it's not my entire job. I do other things. And but people in Asian communities and overseas, this is their life, which is so cool. I'm from Vietnam. Yeah. Right. Um, He's a master in his own right with some of the scripts he does. It's it's amazing. But he you know, he's I I can't imagine what that money translates into his country. But he's oh, man. Beautiful maquille pen holders and and uh, it's really been great to see you know because when I first came into this man it was a desolate wasteland there were a few people who did it you know Mike was around Sol was around but boy it was hard to get information you didn't these books didn't exist online and it really was you know very difficult to, to get a foothold anywhere you know and so then I that's why I feel like it's so exciting now because I hear stories from like you and Michael Sol. And, and people at convention, the, the older community that I'm following about just how things have been and how things were. And now there's so much information and there's so many people who are doing it really good, which is pushing more people to do it really good, um, which is really cool. It's we're, we're closer Mike, than we've is ever there, been. Uh, is there a bigger calligraphy community in Toronto here? There is, I mean, there's a big calligraphy community in Vancouver. It's just not specifically pointed pen, ornamental penmanship. Um, in Toronto, I, it is my belief, like there's a big calligraphy community there and all throughout Canada as well. But there are, there's more pointed pen in Toronto than there is here. And that's, Heather Held's been there for a number of years. So I think she's a big part of the reason why that's a thing, because she's been probably affiliated with the guild there. So it's been something that they've had, sort of access to, whereas I don't think there's been a, and I could be wrong, there could be somebody that I just don't know about. Uh, I know there are modern penmen here that use pointed pen in Vancouver, but as far as what I do, I don't know that there's really been somebody in Vancouver to really teach it. People have potentially come in and done workshops with the guild, um, but I just don't think that it's been something that they have had access to. So nobody, they don't know that they want it yet, basically, which is like when people see ornamental penmanship, it's hard for somebody to watch somebody like me create a beautiful flourish piece in a matter of seconds and not go, wow, that's cool. I want to learn that. If they're like an artistic minded person, it's, it has a catch value for new people. And now this is why with Instagram, there's a reason that some of uh, some penmen have hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram because the things we do are intriguing, are next to impossible, and look cool. So it's so that sort of feeds its growth. Uh, it's hard. So unfortunately, people get in and then also leave because they realize realize how ridiculously challenging it is. But you know, Michael, you mentioned in Canada. What, what's important to point out is that the organization that Michael and I belong to, I am Pith, was started by Canadian penmen. And uh, the two most responsible for it is Fred and Eileen Richardson were Canadians. Um, and also J.J. Bailey is one of the, the, the greatest all-time cursive writers. He was a, he was a, 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 a student of uh, E.C. Mills, and he was also a, a Canadian. So the first Iampa convention was not in the United States. It was up. I can't remember what it was. Some little or out of the way. They had to drive I don't even like remember. two hours and back roads to get there. <laughs> but there's pictures of it on the IAMPTH website. And all it was is a group of penmen, teachers of penmanship that would get together and show different techniques and share scripts and stuff like that. So, you know, we tend to romanticize it a lot when we think about this. Oh, so those guys, it was a job. Men and women, you know, they were teaching penmanship. They were in the daily grind of it or they were writing you know, 200 certificates or something. Or something. <laughs> For us, it's it's the the, the best of it, you know? And, and um, but yeah, Canada had a really important uh, part in that, a real important part. And I forget if F.O. F. Anderson was Canadian. I can't, he was, no, he- I don't it. remember. No. Anyway, but so yeah, it played a really big role in the establishment of Iampeth. Yeah, Canada. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe if I'm president one day, we'll bring convention back to Canada. I don't know if anybody will attend if it's in Canada. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way the dollar is right now, I'm sure they would. I guess. Yeah, true. Yeah. You know, and that I am at the archive you hear us talk about Neil McCaffrey, who makes McCaffrey's Penman's Inc. and these beautiful uh, ink wells. 
you know, Neil actually goes to our, there's a salt mine that we keep this stuff in because the humidity and temperature. And Neil takes it out every convention and drives across the country to set this. And it's not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of stuff. And it's extremely valuable. I mean, it's only valuable to people that respect that. To most people, they would really, no, it would be yeah, just scrap paper to them. But, you know, for us, some of this stuff is, you know, we have the pen holders that, you know, Louis Mataraz used. We have some of his scrapbooks. We ha- I mean, it's it should really be in the Smithsonian, to be honest with you, but <laughs> I don't even think the Smithsonian really cares about it, to be honest with you. No, nobody else cares. There's like, there's a huge archive in the New York Public Library. And when I was, I mean, I got granted access to see it and I spent a few days seeing it and documenting it. And I don't think anybody in the association had ever been there to see it. And nobody in the library knows what it is. It's just this archive that it doesn't mean anything to them. There's a small group of people that's not that small anymore that it means something to. And that's our association. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, I have to share one thing just for fun. Before we end here, oh, no, no, go ahead. This is a go fun ahead. project that I started working on not long ago. I've wanted to do this forever. Now, I apologize. This this is a Chinese knockoff um, because I can't afford to to do this to a a brand new vanishing point at the moment. For years, I've fantasized about leather wrapping. I like leather wrapping everything. Basically, if you know me, you know everything I own. My water bottle, you name it. It's everything is leather wrapped. You're um, holder. Sorry, your oblique pen holder too. Yep. I have my my oblique pen holders leather wrapped. Everything is leather wrapped. Um, so this is this will be wrapped the same way as my oblique holder. It is. I had to take a grinder to it and peel off the the metal casing of the vanishing point, which of well of the the knockoff as it's a moonman or whatever it's called vanishing point. It's not stitched yet. These are just holding the leather tight, but it will be stitched. So the whole thing will be leather and yeah, fun oh, little so random there'll, project. There'll be, no, there'll be no, it won't be higher than the surface. No, it'll be, I mean, the stitching would look just like this and the surface, like this is not over top of the surface. Um, I specifically, yeah, I ground and peeled away the brass uh, and then I skived the leather so it was thinner so that it wouldn't be bulgy. Gotcha. Um, the one issue with this pen, which I didn't realize, as we know with a with a vanishing point, the cone is not attached to the barrel. They are different materials. Um, this is a decimal, but on the vanishing point as well. On this one, there is a line there, but they are they are it's the, it's one piece, unfortunately, because it's I mean it's cheap Chinese manufacturing. Um, and I'm so it leads me to believe when I just when I rip off this back section, I think this little piece here. And the back, I think that's also one piece. There's a seam, but I think it's a faux seam. So I had to grind that away and try to grind it cleanly. Um, but yeah, so it's ground and peeled away the, the outer casing. I would love to do it with a vanishing point eventually. If anybody knows somebody that has like a purse vanishing point that is just destroyed, that I can destroy more. <laughs> um, I've been in the market for one for years. I ask at every pen show I go to. But people take care of their pens, so there are no garbage vanishing points out there. I just want one that's destroyed because uh, I'm going, there's a, well, it's working. But before I did this, I just did this a couple weeks ago or I started working on this one. I didn't know if it was going to work. Like I know there are people that have taken apart vanishing points and they'll do the, like the wood or the acrylic replacements and whatnot. So when I saw somebody do that, I can't remember the website specifically now, um, who does it. But that led me to believe I can make a leather one. I just can't afford to buy and destroy a vanishing point, unfortunately, because I like my decimo and my vanishing point is the black bamboo one, which I'm not willing to. I mean, it's beautiful. Mont Mont Blanc puts out a it's a 146 or 149 sized pen that has leather inlaid into it. Uh Um, But it's a real I mean, obviously, it's really, really expensive. So. uh, yeah, it's really cool. Look, I mean, that would have been nice to do on a machine lathe. That you can get really precise about how far into the pen you're going, you know. But yep, it's, it's, I, I know what you're going after. It looks beautiful. It, it would be. I would be. It would be a. I would love to one day reach out to say Ryan Krusek, um, and have him make something that has an or I mean any pen maker for that matter. Um, to have, we have one on site. Here. I was going to say it could be. We could Mr. talk to Mike. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
to give me that indent. Cause I mean, like I said, I wrap everything in leather. Sure do it. Yeah, yeah. The issue, the issue with fountain pens is it's like the old inlaid or like even like the, you, ha you have to take away the material so that, cause I don't want it to bulge. It has to fit and be part of the pen. Uh, my thing with vanishing points is I just like vanishing points a lot. So I wanted to do one with a vanishing point. If you've seen some of the custom maquillé work that's been done on like Mont Blanc 149s, when the person doesn't take the pen apart, you notice at the at the metal rings and it, the, the pen's thicker than it used to be. Yeah. And it falls, and it, it, I don't know if you remember, I had one maquillé 149 that was expertly done. I mean, mm -hmm. it looked like it was done by the factory. i had never seen its match before or since. And, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's certain finishes people want on pens, but I, I applaud you, Matt. It's pretty cool to see. It's a fun experiment. <laughs> Will that fit a regular pilot uh, uh, pen insert? In other words, would, yep, would they are, they are interchangeable. Wow. Um, I mean, it's, I don't want to, I'm not trying to, I don't promote. Um, no, no, I know, I know. Chinese manufacturing, this was just so I could do it do my experimentation and destroy a cheap pen rather than than an expensive pen but to my knowledge they are completely cross compatible huh you find out yep how did you like that pen the the knockoff one i honestly didn't use it i it, it the time between it coming in the mail and me attacking it with a with an electric grinder was minutes. I opened the box, got my Dremel and just started attacking it. Um, I don't really pause when I have a project idea, like book binding. It was last night, my entire apartment, I was cutting like wood book blocks to make my press. There was sawdust everywhere. When I decide to do a project, it just, it takes over my entire life for the next number of hours until that project's done. So that's what, that's what this was. But then I hit a, then I had to go out of town for a couple months. Uh, no, not for a couple months, for a little bit. So this got put on on hold. But I will dive back into it. And it was also way more work than I thought it would be to uh, to grind and peel away the brass uh, or whatever material it was, the coating. So yeah, I can't say that I... I mean, as far as the pen itself, it feels like a vanishing point. Uh, it's, it's heavy. It's quite a solid... Uh, it's quite heavy for me, but the vanishing point's heavy for me as well, unfortunately. Uh, that's kind of one of the reasons I want to take the outer shell off a of vanishing point and replace it with leather, because it would lighten it up a little bit. Um, but I can't speak to how good the nib is or anything like that, because I never used it. I use my Decimo all the time, or my regular vanishing point with the same insert in it the same nib unit but yeah I like I'm sorry go ahead Joe no no I'm fine I'm fine I'm finished Larry I I got a for, for my first of all uh has there been any time that anyone has asked you to write whatever on whatever uh, they wanted purse cell phone whatever have you ever messed up oh yeah I luckily I haven't messed up anything, anything crazy expensive. Um, uh, one of I could I mean a couple stories. I was in I don't remember what specific city, but I was doing a month long tour through Germany. I basically was doing foiling at every major city and even some smaller towns through Germany for a while. Um, and somebody they the thing they would buy a product, I would customize it, and then we would they would leave. And if people don't write cleanly on the sheet of paper that gives me the name that I'm writing on something, because this is not when I'm on when I'm on location, I'm not designing crazy signatures like what I was showing. They are I only have time to do things on the fly or I'll really quickly just like with a pencil, draw something and then I'll foil it as just a lineup and I don't have time. Um, but as I was going just the name. It was like a an Allen that was A L L A N instead of E N or something like that. Um, I've definitely made those mistakes a number of times, and uh, luckily the company uh, that I was working for and the mistakes haven't been on the crazy expensive things. Uh, they were able to. They just kind of that piece ended up 
we just turned it over and I drew some fancier stuff on it for more so photo promo stuff. And then it could be given away to somebody. And then we made another one for the, for the customer. Uh, my first time actually ever in Germany. And I don't know that I've ever told this story because it was at the time I was not allowed to really talk about it. Um, my first time going to Germany, I was actually in Denmark uh, on vacation at a, at a pen show actually. And they asked if they could, I asked them to send me a bag so that I could test it to make sure it worked. I had my foiling stuff with me when I was traveling. So they sent me a bag and I foiled on it to test how the quality of material was. This was my, I just started foiling so that I didn't know all the answers to all the questions yet because nobody did. I was still figuring out the process. Um, so they sent me this bag. I tested it. It worked good. So we said, cool, it works. Let's go ahead with the job. This was a really quick, I was only in Germany for like 24 hours. I flew in, worked for a flurry of like 14 hours straight, went back to my hotel room, kept working, left a bunch of bags in the lobby of my hotel, and then went back to the airport. Hindsight, stupid to do it that way, but it was just a flurry of a trip. Uh, even them, they were like, oh, we should have kept you here and like done more. It's like, yeah, that'd have been smart. But I don't know. Somebody flew me to Germany, so I wasn't asking questions. Um, when I got to the event, I didn't realize the bag, like it was a special event for this one bag, but it came in multiple colors. And these multiple colors were all the same kind of leather. The blue, which is the one I tested, was good. There was also like a, I don't know if it was the brown or the black that was good, but there was like a yellow, a red, a green. They were all different. Like some of them were softer non-grain, more like a calfskin type of a feel. They were all different. So at the event, not everything worked. Um, but because these were these are very these like six hundred dollars like very expensive bags, I couldn't say oh that didn't work. But I also have a lineup of people drinking like champagne in this store, waiting for their stuff. People are filming. There's a TV crew there, and we're all doing this thing. I can't just be like oh sorry this it doesn't work. Nor can I take forever to fix the 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 product. So we just had to sort of do the peel and play it off like it's supposed to look sort of spotty and vintagey and it's not supposed to be like super clean. Because <laughs> some of them, just, there was nothing I could do. Some of them, yeah, it's, it, we, it was the 90% of them were just distressed. Um, but I had to just act. They asked me that, I, I mean, our hands are tied. Like we just have to basically put on a good show now. And luckily I'm a performer. So if you want to put on a good show, I can help with that. Um, but it was, it hurt me because yep. I do things by hand, but I also hold myself very much accountable for the things I do by hand don't look like they're done by hand all the time. I, I, I aspire to an extremely high level of, of quality when I, when somebody's buying something from me, it, I want it to be perfect and I'll put in the time to make it perfect right. in this instance. There was nothing I could do. So it was, it was, that was tough. That was very tough for me. So could you not have, um, like, if you spelt something wrong or something like that, could you not have turned that into uh, a leaf or a flower or something like that? Potentially could. And with some, like there were, like, same with that A-N to E-N, I can turn A's into E's sometimes. The problem with um, ornamental penmanship, like pointed pen style flourishing and whatnot. There is, oh, see you later, Daniel. He's already gone. Thank oh, you. you oh, he's still here. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Sorry Thanks, for guys. talking so much. No, no, <laughs> Thanks no. For hanging out. Excellent Zoom. <laughs> Sweet. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. See you later. Bye, Dan. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye the flourishes that come off of ornamental penmanship are. There's a specific place that they go and how they kind of have to work. So if I if I have a, a miss, like a, a wrong lowercase letter, the short answer is no. I can't really turn that into another flourish without, which what to me would ruin the piece. To somebody else, maybe they would recognize or a flourish would go through the middle, but I can't bring myself to break my own flourishing rules to do those things. So luckily this was sort of a, communication that happened between the company and I. They're hiring me for my ability to make things work, uh, but they're also hiring me for my expertise in not messing up. 
because it's my technique. So if anybody's not going to mess it up, ideally, that's me. But I mean, I'm human. So I told them I'm human. Like things go wrong. Things go wrong. There's nothing I can do. It's like carving. You do it. If you're carving something, a chunk of wood falls out or a chunk of rock falls off that wasn't supposed to. Yeah, you can't you can't do anything about it. It's just kind of the way it is. Uh, so Speaking luckily, they carving. understood that. Um, I never messed up any of the big bags other than the distressed event. Um, but that wasn't my fault. I blame that on them entirely because that's that's I'm very particular in testing materials. That's one question I get today. I mean, I get emails all the time about foiling questions and whatnot. And people all people want to send me something just to foil. But if it's a material I'm not comfortable with, I've gotten pretty good at sort of feeling and knowing if something will work. But I get surprised sometimes. Something will feel like it works great and I'll foil an entire piece. And I've, I've posted some videos in the past where you do that peel. People always say the peel is so satisfying. And yes, it is. But it's also incredibly stressful because sometimes you peel and nothing's there. Or in the worst case, you peel and there's some stuff there, but just enough that it's not a full design because then you can't just put it back down because it's not lined up properly. There's no real way to line it up properly. I have techniques on fixing bad foils, but it takes get your, hours. Get your foil pin out. Yeah, like the only way to fix it because you can't see through foil. I can't see where the line is. I legitimately, my technique for it is I cut the foil into thin, like one thirty second or one sixteenth of an inch strips of foil, and I have to lay them and do like like a dotted line, one dot at a time, because it's the only way I can see where I'm going. Otherwise, nothing's going to line up. And when you're doing something like ornamental penmanship, which is all a single flowing, fluid, beautiful line, it's like worst case scenario for messing up. It's, mm -hmm. you have to, so I have to do a dotted line and make it look, it's so time consuming. It's, I'm always, and it still happens to this day, things mess up and I have, I have to s dedicate an entire afternoon to fixing somebody's piece because I went too fast or I didn't have the heat on properly or this particular piece of leather. That's a frustrating thing too. Like I buy full hides. Sometimes the, the neck will take different or the chemical set for a little bit longer on one part of the hide. Or if the manufacturers like handle the piece, then there's oils in there. And I can't really take those oils off or prep the leather because that changes the color, especially if it's a bag or something. I can't just like acetone and clean leather. That takes the color off. Same with with uh, um, like alcohol or something. So there's there's a lot of variables. When it works good, it works great. But when it doesn't work good, there's a lot of variables. I now feel like I've found almost every scenario of fixing a bad situation. Um, but there are it's scary. So okay. I get a lot of people email me how to fix those problems because now people are doing events. I know Calligraphy Crush Magazine had an article about foiling just this past month that I'm not even a part of. So there's other people that it's their business now, like working at Nordstrom foiling bags. I I apparently created an industry, which is great. Um, so well, that's cool. Who are engraving on bottles and glassware yeah. and stuff like that. Michael, you mentioned something before. We don't have time for it now, but maybe <laughs> in the future we could talk about card carving.